breath of life. You guys are, you guys are going to uh, not be surprised to hear this, but um, I was asked one time, why did you become a pastor? And, and I, people ask me that question because I'm, I'm a, I was a second career pastor. I've only been, I'm in my fourth year, so I'm still learning. Check back in 30 or 40, maybe I'll have a clue by then. But, but in the meantime, maybe not, right? In the meantime, um, the, the, I get asked this question a lot. And whenever people ask me this, I'm just like, which do you want the two-minute answer, the 30-second answer, the mindless quip, or do you want to like go out for coffee? Because that's really where, that's, I want the go out for coffee answer, right? And, and the reason I bring that up is because all of us, if I were to sit down with you and I were to ask you, why did you become whatever it is you did for a living? Or even those who, have, who stay at home and homeschool the kids, or if you, if you are like, I'm a retired person and I work on the boat now. You know, that's how it works. Wherever you're at in that, in that storyline of your story, I could ask you, well, what led you to choose that? What led you to do that? You know, what led you to get the great spot with the sun rises? And what led you to do this? And what led you to do that? You know, we could all go out for coffee and talk that and tell that story. The scripture we read today is the most important part of the story of God that we can ever learn. Because the scripture that we read today is the thing that makes a difference in all that matters most. In what matters most, it makes the difference, right? Because if you and I live this life, if you and I live this life and think, well, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. I mean, that's, there's no hope there, right? And I know it may be, it, like, it, really, it relieves anxiety, because, I mean, I love to eat, so, I mean, I can go do that right now. Uh, and drinking is fine, too. I'll go enjoy a good one. But the point is this. It doesn't give us anything. It doesn't lead anywhere. And beyond the next hill, there's nothing, right? And I'm one of these guys that just says there has to be something, right? And I, you know, when I was young, I was trying to figure out what is the thing on the other side of the hill. I want to know. And I asked everybody and drove my parents crazy and everybody in between. But here's my thing, guys. This is, oh, when we're on page two of the Bible, right here on page two of the Bible, right off the bat, the story gets good. It gets rolling. And we're going to zoom in and take a look at this because I want you to ask yourself what's on the other side of the hill. For you. I mean, that's, that's, what I, that's why I'm here today. You know, we were, taught, we were joking this morning, like half the churches in town canceled today because of an ice storm. And we understand why. We want everybody to be safe. But I'm here to tell you, I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. I just need you to melt the ice because we got work to do. Take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And, and this is one of those where, you know, Mark's got his tool book, toolbox out and we're, we're cranking away and you're going to see all these brackets on here and I'm really, I'm not apologizing. We've got to work on this. So the first thing you need to know is the green word, the Lord. It's in all caps. And whenever you time you see that in your Bible, that is the personal name of God. It's pronounced Yahweh, right? And so it says Yahweh Elohim in Hebrew, Yahweh God, the Lord God. And, and Je- chapter 2 is the first place we see God's name. And I think it's quite interesting to know that it's also the first time we're going to really get the name of a human, right? So this is when the story gets personal. That's that's where we're going with this. And that's my objective today with you and me is that we see this story get very personal. So the Lord God formed the Adam. It says man in our English versions, but the Hebrew word is Adam. That's the name for human. That's the name for humanity, right? Formed the Adam from the dust of the Adama, right? So when you think of, when you think of Adam, I mean, you just, I want you to think dirt guy. Because that's what he was. He's the dirt guy. And was he dirty? Well, yeah, I mean, but what, then there's all kinds of cool stuff about that because that means God got down in the dirt to make him, right? Formed him. And so you got Adam, which means dirt guy, from the dust of the dirt, the ground, but it's not just ground like, you know, land. It's dirt, right? So the dirt guy, and then here's what's interesting. There's this next word, and it's the, you know, all of the, it just says he breathed into his nostrils, right? But it's, guys, it's yipach. You know, you got to spit a little bit when you say it, yipach. And what that means is that he blew into his nostrils. And he blew, and it's a synonym for when someone's trying to start a fire. You guys ever done, you've been out camping, and you're like, you know, trying to get the fire to go, and you know, and it's like, this is why I don't go, go camping, because I can't do that. But, but if you were trying to do it, and you're like, you know, that's what you're doing. And what's interesting, because you're like, well, Mark, does it mean that, he, that God was like trying to start a fire in Adam, or does it just mean that, that he was blowing in that way? And I think the answer is yes. 
I don't think God really tries to do anything. I think he just does, right? That's kind of we already saw that on page one. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. I mean, that's just how it works with God. He's not contingent. We are contingent. He's not. Everything, whatever he says, happens. But when he blew into the nostrils of Adam, it gave him this thing called the breath of life. The breath of life. Now, we know what that is. We don't have to think about that. If you come out of your, of your, of your, of your back door and you see where your, your dogs or your cats or whatever have brought you a trophy, you know that it's dead, right? You, you, you don't have to wonder, oh, wow, great, dead creature. Everybody's like, do your dogs do that? I'm like, well, maybe. But the idea is, is that you, you know what's when something's alive and you know when something's dead. We don't ever have to wonder about that. And, and here we are, this idea of the breath of life. But I want you to see... That God's view of life is bigger than ours. The story is getting personal, guys. The story is getting personal. The breath of life. And the Adam, the man, became a living, oh, there's that word again, nephesh. It has been the joke around our house all week. because you know, Nobody else remembers that word, but my kids do. They're like, you know, okay, dad's got the nephesh going. Yeah, but this, what is nephesh? This is the word that gets translated. Of course, here in this sentence, they translate it as being. But most of the time in the Bible, this word gets translated as soul. And this, this is getting personal. So we've got to talk about this. Because, you know, you and I have grown up in the Western Hemisphere, and we've grown up, most of us, educated, you know, through standard secular education. And we, we, we were brought up with what's called Platonic philosophy. And everybody's like, oh, roll, eyes are rolling, right? And right in the back of your head, check out, I'm done. But why is that important? Because we have been raised to think that you have a body, and you have a soul. And the Bible says you are a soul. The Bible says you are a living soul. And that includes your body. And you're like, wait, what? And, I mean, and so it's a category issue. We have these two distinct categories that we operate with. We've all been raised and taught these things. It's in all our media. It's in all our books and our movies and everything. And, and we, just, it should, we just absorb it, and it is what it is. But the Bible's story is like, no, 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 you are a soul. And that, that left arm or that right arm or that earlobe or what, that's part of your soul. And we're like, but that doesn't make sense because when we think of a soul, we define that as an immaterial thing. Like, right, you can't feel it. But wait a minute, I just, I could feel that. And see, this is the interesting. The Bible is going to do this whole thing where it includes the body and your soul. Your body and your soul are your soul. See? It's a category change, and it's so important. And you're thinking, Mark, who cares? You're like splitting hairs. You're wearing us out. The ice is melted. We could be at the Golden Corral by now. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 and 44, we're going to look at these together because, see, here's the thing. We, didn't, we weren't alive. We weren't around on page 2 of the Bible, but we are here, and we're very much in the broken world. Page 2, the world wasn't broken yet. It didn't get broken until page 3. But now, remember, this story gets personal. You and me, we're in the broken Have you ever stood in front of a coffin that had a dead body in it? I know you have. And for those of you who haven't, it'll come soon. I hate to tell you, but this is the real world. And this is where it gets personal. Okay? Because here's the thing, guys. Either God solves the death problem or it's all a big joke. And this is where, you know, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, we're in that. I'm taking you out to coffee to tell you why I became a pastor part. Because here's the thing. If, if dead people don't come back, then it's all worthless. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. It's junk. And I actually am thinking of much worse words when I say that. And that is what we're talking about today. We're not just talking about the breath of life. We're talking about eternal life. And most people, because we were raised in a platonic philosophical structure, we keep those categories going, and we think when the body dies, then the soul just floats away and goes to the place where they play harps. And I don't have anything against harps, but that's not the story of the Bible. Debbie's, or I mean, Allie's always trying to teach me, Dad, harps are cool. I'm like, okay, all right, well, I can get into that. But the, in the meantime, I want you to see this. The body, that's the physical thing, as we would describe it, is sown, imperishable, and most of us in our belief system thinks then the body becomes irrelevant. But it is not. It is sown as a seed goes into the ground, Paul wrote, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to come out. It'll look different. Just like this, you put, put the acorn in there, when it comes out, it looks different, right? This is what we're talking about. It is raised imperishable. 
I'm talking imperishable, immortal. Death has no power over it. There's no death. There's no disease. There's no brokenness. The body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. Look what, we, look what happens. There's our categories. We're in trouble. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And I bet most of us, even in our catechism or confirmation classes, were taught, and this is crazy, we were, I was taught in my confirmation class, spirit means immaterial. It means something you can't see. And yet, the body that he's describing, he says, is just like the body Jesus had, and yet they could see him, and he ate breakfast with them. He was like eating the food, and it didn't fall through his body. It stayed in it, right? And, this, and he went out of his way. Jesus went out of his way to demonstrate to him, to them, I should say, that he was very physical in his spiritual body. See, and this is so important, guys, because if we think that spirit means we can't see it or that it's immaterial or that it's some sort of a fluffy bunny thing, then we lose the promise of the resurrection of the body, which here at our church, we confess every week. We say that we believe in that. What does it look like? That's what it looks like. And you're like, yeah, but what does a spiritual body look like? Join me on Easter morning, right? We're going to talk a lot about that. Jesus comes out of the grave, and like the people are, you know, he has a couple moments where he says, hey, don't hang on to me yet because I'm going to my father. Well, that's because she was hanging on to him, right? And then he shows up and he goes, peace be with you. And he's like, let's eat some breakfast. You got some fish? Let's eat it, right? And this is, this is what's going on. And then, yeah, he could do some things that don't make sense. He could like come in a room where the doors are locked. And he could do all kinds of things. And he could appear on the, on the shore. And he could do different things. And he knew where people were. And he could appear in more, place than one, at more than one place at once. We learn earlier in this chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. And this whole thing, I, I'm slow down. I'm excited, right? This is, this is the most important thing. It's a spiritual body. Guys, the story of the Bible begins on page one. You remember we've been, we've been doing this, and the design all along is that there would be kids playing and music in the background and people singing and having feasts, and there would be no death and no crying and no sickness. And then we broke it. And ever since, that's all we've had is death and crying and sickness. And the promise of God to you, it gets personal. The promise of God to you is that that is, that is not how this is going to end. That is not where this is going. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 and 47. Again, we're putting them together. Because you need to see how it works. It's personal. The first man, Adam, became a living being. A nephesh, right? There it is again, right? Everybody's like, oh. The last Adam, that is Jesus, the second Adam, a life-giving spirit. Most people will say spirit means something you can't see or touch, and yet that's exactly what Jesus is. He's a life-giving spirit. But you're like, but, but, yeah, I'm sorry. It's the categories. We were given wrong categories. It's my job to give us right categories, to show us what the Bible says. And so look what he says. He says, the first man was of the dust of the earth. It was the dirt guy. Second man, the heaven guy. See, and here's what the thing. We think heaven means floaty, floaty, and harps. That's what we think it means. And it doesn't. It means a dude who comes down and says, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's go. That's a slight paraphrase, but you know what I'm saying. Actually, he's like, come at me, bro. That's more like whatever. So take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. Because we've got to see what this does. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, that is, you and I inherited Adam's sin. There's that biblical word for brokenness. The, the junk, the mess, the crying, the death, the disease. We inherited all of that. We bore his likeness, even us females, right? The daughters, excuse me, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, as C.S. Lewis would write. We all have that, right? So shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. It's the promise of God for you. It gets personal. It's personal for you. I want you to know that if you've got that one left knee, I'm talking about my left knee, that just absolutely gives you a fit every time the weather changes, and it changed this weekend, so I've been having a fit. And then it makes my left hip not work, and, then, and, and we could go on, right? Those are just the aches and pains. What about those among us who have disease? What about those who we ask God to heal, and he says, not yet? What about those who wind up in the casket what about those? See, if, if we don't have a plan, if we don't have hope for that, then I don't want nothing to do with none of this. You ask me why I became a pastor. Because everybody needs to know this. Everybody needs to have the hope of the risen 
Christ, the risen, when we say He is risen indeed, we are saying so shall you and me. It's personal for you and for me. We shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. And you know, I, I don't know about y'all guys, but I'm like going to go check out the Andromeda Galaxy as soon as I get that ability. But that's just because I'm weird. Remember, that's holy. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Because what do we do in the meanwhile? What do we do in the meanwhile? Like, Because right now, I still don't have that, that body like he has, as I've just mentioned. And you don't either. Look at this. The sting of death is sin. When the Bible talks about the sting of death, it is sin. Sin is that thing that causes us to not do what we want to do. It causes us to do the things that we don't want to do and to not do the things that we do want to do and just wind up just destroying everything. If left to ourselves, we just mess it all up. That's what sin is. And look what the power of the sin is. This is critical. Because my whole life, I've been, I've been inundated with this idea that if you'll just be a better person, it'll all work out right. And to be sure, to be sure, if I take out the trash before mama gets home, it goes better for me. Make no mistake. But you need to understand that's not the way it works between us and God. The power of sin is the law. When people say, thou shalt, that gives sin power. Paul says in other places like the book of Romans, book of Galatians, book of Ephesians, book of, of, of Colossians, that it's by the, by the, excuse me, that the law actually shows us our sin. As soon as somebody says, thou shalt, you become aware, very much aware of how you ought but can't. Like, for example, thou shalt not steal. Now, I bet most of us in this room would say, I've never stolen anything. What are you talking about? Well, but see, at the very moment, <laughs> well, to quote Paul from Romans and Galatians, it's like the very moment that say, they said, don't covet, that was when I became aware that I covet. Right? And if you start taking Jesus' definition of stealing, which is when I even want to have what my neighbor has, but I don't have it, or I even like steal a glance at my neighbor's wife, or you know, just on it goes, right? There's a problem in here. You know, and then that one time when I was on the clock and I took an extra five minutes of actually not doing anything but still got paid. You know, Jesus is like, yeah, that's actually stealing, right? And so we could say, Oh, but that doesn't matter. Well, where do you stop with the it doesn't matter, right? The power of sin is the law. The law says thou shalt, we find out we can't. And then what do we do? Well, then it becomes thou shalt try harder. And then we try harder. And then that results in despair. And, if it, and then if we go, well, thou shalt try even harder and do even more, then we, become, we find out, well, then maybe God doesn't even love me because I can't. And if I can't, what does that mean? To which we say, thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our ability? No. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory! Now again, I know that like everybody like puts that name on their church building. This is Victory Church. You know? and, I, and I get all that. And we, and we appreciate that. And so sometimes it becomes a churchianity thing. It becomes a cliche. I want you to know that victory looks like this. When you're at home and you know about the thou shalt and you ain't, right? You, you shout, but you ain't. You ought to, but you ain't. And so now you're stuck in that, and you're like, well, what's God going to do? Answer, send Jesus. Cry out to him. Victory means you're sitting there, and you're literally wallowing in your own mud puddle of sin, and you cry out the name of Jesus. That's called repentance. It's when we cry out to him, we, we're going this way, and he's, when we say, I want to go with you. I don't know how. Give me the power. Guess what? He promised he would. And that's when we get to say, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? I don't know about y'all, but we've got the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring it on. Come at me, bro. Slight paraphrase. I want you to remember this. It's personal. Yes, he breathed in. He started a fire in Adam. And Adam lit the whole forest on fire as a result. And he burned it all down. The story keeps going. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. And the more God says, you shouldn't do that, they do it even more. And it's almost like every time he says something, you shouldn't do that, then that's what they do. And that's because the power of sin is the law. So don't try harder. Don't do more. Just cry out the name of Jesus. He promised he will make you like him. And we're going to pray about that right now. Father, we need your help because... On our own, we can't do anything. But you have promised that through Jesus, we can. 
And I pray right now that You would put in our hearts the very personal promise of resurrection. And that by that promise, we would remember how it happens. It happens through Jesus. When we are struggling, help us look at Jesus. When we are having a great day, help us look at Jesus. When it's anywhere in between, help us look at Jesus. When we're rock bottom, fix our eyes on Jesus. Because there and only there will we have hope. Anytime we put the burden on our shoulders, we will have despair. Remind us of this reality. And teach us and grow us in Your Word and in the story that is so very personal. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.